Would you pray with me, please? Gracious Heavenly Father, over the next few moments, may what we have experienced and continue to experience be the reminders of your grace. And we pray, O oh God, that you would allow us to use ordinary means to be uh, reminded of your unfailing love and your steadfast faithfulness. For it is in your precious name that we pray. Amen. So the other day I was um, with uh, a large group of people and, and those who know me well know that I and large group of people do not get along. I remember when uh, Anna and John were going to uh, Columbus High School and they had a few nights before school, maybe a week, where you go in and you see all the extracurricular activities that are available and you walk into the uh, cafeteria and there are tables after tables after table and chairs and people just like like this kind of, excuse me, excuse pardon me, and they're just moving all around. and. And at one point, being um, an introvert like I am, it, I, I just had just told, I just told Anna and John, I, I got to go outside. It's hot in there. Well, you all understand that. I mean, but it, it is there's the crowd of people. This was another one of those scenarios. And, and I was trying to be a good faker and, and seem like um, I was cordial and nice. And uh, my family would say amen for the faking part. But uh, the, uh, and so I went to this one gentleman and we were all wearing name tags and, and he looked across the table at me while as I introduced myself and we started talking and he said, how do you spell your last name? Well, I said F as in Frank, that's what we always say. F as in Frank, U-G-H. And then he furrowed his brow and he said, I knew a few, and I said, oh. So now I kind of moved around the table. I said, now, that's interesting. I'm always looking. It's not like Smith or Jones. There's not many fews out there. And maybe, just maybe, they're related to us. Of course, there is another John Few, other than my dad and my son out there. He was a, a, an Asian general in the United States Army, a judge advocate general. And he, um, he had passed away. So I knew there was a John Few from an Asian descent and, and we're German descent. And I, I, uh, I went ahead and, and I asked him, I said, well, what nationality was he? Because I'm trying to figure out. Maybe I know, maybe he's that lost, long lost uncle or great uncle that, you know, everybody kind of like avoids at Thanksgiving. Okay, we, maybe, maybe he's that kind of, and he said the nationality repeat he says well he was a he was lunatic and I thought well hold on a second did wait a minute did I hear you right I, I'm not sure where that's located at he I he so I asked him I said, now did you say lunatic yeah now he all of a sudden my whole being goes into defensive mode you, you know why I mean because it's my name you know, few, and so I'm, I'm defending, well, tell me, uh, how did you know him? What, what descent? Now I wanted to find out, was he German? Maybe he wasn't. Well, he was one of my commanders in the army and, and, and things like that. And, and I'm like, and now I'm trying to dig, and, and now I'm trying to show him that we, well, one time we spelled our name differently. So maybe this is not the guy you're thinking of. And so I'm trying to defend my, uh, my name and my, uh, my ancestors and stuff like that. And, and then I, I then said, well, um, we're just probably not related. I mean, I have no idea that I, I, I am certain I've never met a lunatic in the Few family. <laughs> Now, you all just started flashing in your minds, my family and me, and you're questioning that maybe. I, I don't know. But how do you, I was thinking the other day, how could I have confirmed that with him? I, I sat down and asked him the nationality. I, I showed him a different spelling with the F U with an umlauf over it and G without the H. I said, well, it used to be the Fug family. And, and, uh, and I, I was thinking, how could I have confirmed? How, because I left that conversation wondering if my relatives were lunatics. 
uh, you know, in his defense. I wonder how I could have, con- we, we love confirmations. We get a confirmation when we have, um, when we order something. Uh, we, we might get a confirmation of an airline ticket that we had bought. Uh, if you register for youth events or children's events, VBS or uh, a summer camp or beach trip or whatnot, you will get a confirmation email to let, know, let you know that, that we have received your registration. And I like personally um, text messages or emails that, that I get a response. Even though I'm not asking anything, I, I like... Now, no, this is, if you want to write something down, this is probably what to write down. I like just a response that says, thank you, got it. I don't trust technology that much all the time. And those that I work with know that I really like it in 24 hours. But those who don't, you know, I, okay, so not a staff meeting or anything like that. But, but we'd love this, this confirmation we, we wanted, I, we, I wanted to confirm my name. I wanted to get confirmation from things that I have uh, registered for. And, 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 and then with this being such a powerful thing that helps us on the inside, the confirmation, the confirming, the act of confirming a resp- with a response, I wonder how important it is in our faith walk. Have you ever wondered, have you ever wondered if God is with you? Certainly there are moments when it's undeniable, but I wonder if there are moments when all you want is a confirmation. You're not asking for the Chattahoochee to be parted. You're not asking for it not to rain. You just want to say a prayer and the air conditioner start. You just want to say a prayer and, and have, have this moment actually unfold at, in your time schedule. And when we get them, it's like the parking lot dilemma. We pray, God, you know where I need to be. I need a parking spot. And then all of a sudden, one pops up, and you walk out of that car like you are on cloud nine. Look what I did. I just had God answer a prayer for me. And you feel confirmed in your faith. There are certain things that this leads into, this mentality and this practice that it really becomes a slippery slope. There are connections that we we often ignore in our our lives, and um, and, and it really kind of pushes back on our idea of how God confirms in us, how God actually reminds us or reveals himself in our faith journey, because we know What happens when our faith is confirmed, when we actually feel and sense God moving? We become more confident that God is who he says he is. But what happens in those moments where it sounds like crickets when you pray? What happens in those moments when you feel discouraged and alone, that your prayers are not even going above the ceiling. We live our lives in silos. We live our lives in compartments, and we try really hard. Now, maybe not you in this week, but let me just say, I try really hard to separate my silos, my silo of, of uh, playing sports, my silo to office, my silos to go into hospitals to visit, my silos with my family, and I don't want them to cross over. I want things to be right where they are and in, in these, these moments. 
the, we, we look at our days, and if we look at Monday through Saturday, we, we can think of a Monday or a Tuesday, and you probably can go over your calendar this coming week when you're thinking of different things that are coming up. And they are, in of themselves, individual moments that probably for the most part, whether it's your intention or your wish, they don't bleed over to other areas. So we're pretty good at that. If you're a student on a sports team, or if you're a student on a, in a drama or a play or a musical, you know that there are different relationships, different things that happen, different requirements, different expectations, and we don't want those to fl flood over to the next ones. And then we get our Sundays in there. And then Sundays actually start to become the verses in our spiritual growth. And Sundays just have proverbial time where we intentionally come together and we worship. It is meant to be that space. But then when Monday through Saturday come up, we think it's different. We think it's, it unfolds differently that, that this worship, this intentional space, this is God's opportunity, our opportunity to reconnect and reposition, which is very good and intended. But the problem is when we think that these two are opposed to each other, that they don't flow through. And, and I use Sundays as that proverbial time that you sit down to actually worship or a devotion. It could be a part of the day. It could be the very first thing or the very last thing. It could be a lunch break when you go to the park and you sit down and you read your scripture and you memorize scripture and, and you pray and, and you, uh, you know, worship God. It, it doesn't have, to, it's just a metaphor for a Sunday. And then every other moment of that day or that week is, is silent. There are a wall built up. Because we're so easy and it's so common for us to do, we, we don't let things in and we don't let God in. We don't let God unfold what he's doing in our lives. You see, the intervention of God in our lives through his Holy Spirit is, was never intended to be siloed or one moment or not to bleed over to other areas of our lives. We look in John, the Holy Spirit works in every other area of our lives. Every days, the Mondays, the Tuesdays, the 9 a.m.s, the 3 p.m.s, the 1 a.m.s, God is working through his Holy Spirit. He says in John chapter uh, 14, he says, Jesus says, the friend, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send at my request, will make everything plain to you. It, notice it's something in the future, and these words have been preserved for us. We are still living in that trajectory of these words. The stone that has been thrown into the still pond, the wake, the ripples, are st we are still bobbing in the water of, th through those ripples of these words Jesus said. And he will remind you of all the things I have told you. He will, he will make everything plain. He will intercede. There is nothing in this scripture that is subjunctive, that it might happen, or it's conditional. This is the fact that Jesus said, the Holy Spirit, he, I will send this advocate, this one who walks alongside of you, and he will make everything plain to you. He will remind you of my words, and he will go ahead, and he will, um, uh, he will teach you the significance of, of these words. And so when you think of the trials, the t tribulations, the problems, the worries, the frustrations, the broken relationships of the Mondays through Saturdays, and our intentional 
deliberate times are Sundays, whatever time of the day it is, but those times that were intentional, it is plain that the intention of God's Spirit, the purpose of what God wants to do in us, is those that, is that it would not be siloed. That, that it would not be separate. That the intention is that the work of God would, would be involved in every part of our life. That the transformation of our lives and the faith confirmation that God is with us, that, God, that these are in our real lives. Not that this is not real, but our Mondays and our Saturdays and our Fridays. At this level of real life, it goes hand in hand with the choices that we make. You see, what the Holy Spirit does is that it moves within our souls, and especially in our minds, and, and, it, and it desires to present to us Jesus Christ. And it desires to present and reveal to us His kingdom and not just the kingdom of 2,000 years ago when he walked the earth but the present kingdom of God working right now all of this is to confirm our faith and our confidence as Jesus being the one and the work of God through us nothing we do can keep God from moving, confirming, and revealing himself. And nothing we do can convince God more to reveal, to move, to confirm, or to reveal himself. But faith confirmation and transformation happens when we recognize God moving in our midst. That we allow the word of God and the scripture to actually, actually infiltrate our relationship, our internet browsing, our driving, our family, our friends. This, first and foremost, so very important that actually God is not waiting for you to move waiting for you to do something so that he can move he is already working in your life faith confirmation and transformation within is the intentional part on us to recognize it happening. You cannot overemphasize God's work in your life. We love to overemphasize people, don't we? You, you, we love to overemphasize things, games, NCAA sporting events. We, we love, and you can recognize it when other people do it. What's it like to be with someone who overemphasizes their kids? their jobs, their worth, their value. We don't usually notice underemphasizing, unless it's about us. But we can't miss when people overemphasize. Unfortunately, today in our practice of Christian Christianity and many circles of Christianity, the only time that we usually overemphasize God's working and God's presence is when it results from our obedience. I prayed, and look what God did. Oh God, you're great. I, am dis I did my devotions every day this week. I spent quiet time with God, and there has not been one bad thing that happens 
Thanks be to God. Now, God could be moving in that, but we don't overemphasize the work of God as, as, through, as, as a means of, our, of us being the trigger to that. We don't trigger God to do things. God moves. God reveals. The invitation is to see God in the Mondays through Saturdays, in the trials, in the tribulation. So we get to our passage of Scripture. And it says, And he said to them, The kingdom of God is like a man, or as if it is as if a man should go and scatter ground, uh, seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. And look, notice what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about the kingdom of God, God moving. Our, we have our own kingdom. God's kingdom is running, and we, we recognize this is what Jesus is, how Jesus is describing the kingdom of God. And the seed sprouts and sows, and he knows not how. Who's the he? Is it talking about God doesn't know how? Is it the seed that doesn't know how? No, the farmer doesn't know how it happens. He continues. The earth produces itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And notice here how this unfolds. It is the earth doing it. Now, when you take that metaphor, and Jesus is using it to describe the kingdom, what he wants his readers and his listeners, rather, what he wants his listeners to hear is that God's work in your life is not contingent on you understanding how it works. Nor is it contingent on your proximity to God. It happens night and day, night and day, and finally that seed gives birth and the harvest has come. It is God moving, whether or not that, that man, that farmer goes out and plays ping pong all day until it sprouts and becomes ripe. It happens, and that's the same thing that happens with God. Through his Holy Spirit, we see from Genesis to Revelation, we see it in the lives and the stories that are told of the early church, and even we can hear the stories around the kitchen table from our family and then notice it in ourselves. That after you see God move, you look back on that moment and you think, man, what happened? I didn't even, I didn't even realize God was there. We know this is how, because God... And his work through the Holy Spirit is not contingent on you understanding it. It just happens. It transforms us. And this is why faith confirmation is missed. It's not because God is not working. It's because we are not responding to God working. It, it's not, if we don't respond, it doesn't stop God working. It, in, it, it, it inspires us as it reveals to us God's presence. The action of God, the work of God, is accompanied by our response only to confirm in us our faith. God is who he says he is and that he will do what he promises to do. If you think of the, the spirit of God working like a river, the boundaries are your Sundays. Those are the times that we get to worship. Those are the times of the day that we set aside. But also on the other side are the bad days trials, the tribulations. It's, it's the rule of these Mondays through Saturdays. 
when we accept the trials, uh, the, the ordinary days that we find ourselves as a place of God's kingdom, as a place of God's blessing, as a place of the Holy Spirit's active work in our lives. Because God has yet to bless anybody except where they actually are. Where are you right now? Where will you be tomorrow? Thursday at 11.45 a.m. And God has blessings for us in categories we have never yet defined. So as we look at this, we ask this question, we make this statement, whatever comes will Think of how you respond to that. In one of the greatest chapters of our affirmation of faith, Paul says in Romans 8, in this chapter it begins with there is no condemnation, it ends with there's no separation from the love of Christ, and in the middle it says we are more than conquerors. There is not one imperative, one command in that whole chapter. That chapter, Romans 8, is all about the Holy Spirit's work in your life. Everything, whether you recognize it or not, what God is doing inside, outside, within you, and through you. You, as Job said, cannot thwart the plans of God. And at the end of that chapter, Paul starts to ask these questions. Who is against us if God is for us? Who is able to condemn us? Who is going to rise up as a witness against us? Will not God give us all things if he's already given us his son? And then the very last question, he says, what can separate you from the love of God? And he invites them to start thinking of things. And I do the same. Whatever comes will. How do you answer that? break me. It will rattle my faith. Whatever comes will give me angst, will cause me to crumble on the inside. Whatever comes will only confirm the goodness and the greatness of the God who has welcomed us into the world. And this is why James can say, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. It's in these places where we are reminded when the Spirit of God is in the boundaries of a Sunday moment, or however that plays out in Monday through Fridays, or, and the trials those two things become the the boundaries for the rushing Spirit of God to come through. That it is the work of the Holy Spirit to confirm our faith. And it's our intention to develop that and our invitation to bring God in this place. So it's absolutely essential. If you want your faith to be confirmed, that you accept the Monday through Saturday moments as the place where we are to experience and find the reign of God with us as actual reality. See every moment, every moment, not just those moments that we think God has answered our prayers. Every moment as an occasion in which the faithfulness of God is confirmed in you. It's a place that God's, the reality of God's 
concrete presence. Becomes a fact. And you know what it does? It confirms. It grows your confidence. It does something inside of you. It's a great moment when you can say, God, this is not my problem. God, you are with you, said that you will carry me. When Jesus told his disciples, do not be afraid when they arrest you, put you in chains, take you before the magistrate. Well, he said, Jesus said, don't worry what you will say. Well, Jesus, how about you not let me get arrested or put in chains? No, Jesus doesn't say that. He just says, don't worry what you will say. I am there. My spirit will give you the words to say. And if you have any doubts of what I'm saying, read Romans 5.1. Romans 5.1 says this, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, big word, but all it means is it's a legal declaration. Whether you believe it or not, once you say yes to God, the declaration is instantaneous. It happens at that moment and you are justified. You have been standing before the judge. People have been giving all of the evidence to say you are not worthy and all this stuff. And God says, not guilty. Whether you believe you're guilty or not, whether the other people believe you're guilty or not, you are not guilty. Because of this, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. It's not that God is our enemy. Or we are enemies of God. It's just those anxious, necessary confirmations that we're not recognizing. They just... They give us an unsettling feeling. See, the reality... You are at peace with God. You are. So trust in these frozen faith moments that what Jesus tells you does not make him a lunatic or a liar or even anything worse than that. That he is who he says he is. And the Holy Spirit wants to flow. So open a door. Crack a window. Recognize God in that place. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you continue to move in our midst with us, through us, and for us. Confirm in us, O oh God, our faith and your presence. It's in your Son's precious name we pray. Amen. Glad Eric Buchanan skinny enough to get past those drums to get back in there. Our closing song is My Savior, My God. Would you please stand and join us? to understand what 
God has will or God has planned I only know at His right hand Stands one who is my Savior I take Him at His word and deed Christ died to save me, this I read My heart will find a need of Him to be my Savior. That He would leave this place on high and come for sinful men to die. You count as strange, so once did I before I knew my Savior. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior's always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God, He's always gonna be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior's always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God, He's always gonna be. Yes, live and die and let me pray. Strength, my solace from this spring. That he who lives to be my king and start to be my savior. That he will leave this place on high and come for sinful men to die. You count as strange, no one's did. Before I knew my Savior, my Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior's always gonna be. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior's always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior's always there for me. Remember, after the service, don't forget to come up and welcome uh, um, Eric. And uh, the library Sunday school class will meet in here following this service. Now hear this benediction from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. So may it be for you. Amen. Amen.